This meeting is being recorded. Good. Yeah, well, thank you for, for sponsoring it and making it possible. And uh, it's always a, a bit of a dive when I think, why don't, you know, why don't I do this? And, uh, and then it's so stimulating for me because um, a lot of this material, it's stuff I'm interested in and I tend to it and I go through it and I read about it and then I forget it. Everybody can probably relate to that. And we need ways to interact with information that's important to us and information about how the physical world functions is, is worth worthy information, but I need to remind myself. So I'm happy to do these programs and uh, put these slideshows together. It's, it's very enjoyable. So this one was interesting to me because it's supposedly on the microcosm and I'm sort of referring to bacteria and group of organisms called archaea and fungi, what I call fungi. Um, and because I started putting it together two weeks ago, it would seem pretty short. And then every day I'd add another slide or two. And now it's pretty long. And it went off on a, I went off on a tangent. The tangent at the beginning, I like to think of it as esoteric, which means unusual and not eccentric, which means off balance. <laughs> But what I really, what really started to strike me was how dynamic the planet is. And so I put, the first few slides are what we call GIFs, you know, that's the ending of the, their action slides. They show a little action, just a little action, but to, to illustrate this dynamic quality of the planet that is really just stunning. So there's, uh, I put underneath this, I'm gonna see if I can, hopefully it'll come up. Let's see here, <clears throat> there. I just brought up at the bottom, it says, uh, it's a natural history of the mental, but it's in an evolutionary and ecological context. Well, who knows what I mean by that? But for evolution, if you look at that picture, everything in that picture has evolved over time. None of that was there originally. And that actually brings up a small gripe of mine. And that is that science has a way of uh, taking the magical power of the universe, of draining it away. So what do I mean by that? Well, there, so it all started with the Big Bang. And I think I've been I've run this by you before, but so the Big Bang, everything appeared from from nothing in a single instant. I mean, come on, give me a break. You know, <laughs> is that science or is that a is that a <laughs> is that a magic trick? And so there, uh, there's there's many aspects of life like that. And science does not know how life arose on the planet. It's tried to figure it out for the last 2000 years and it doesn't know why, you know, life is simple organisms are not simple, they're complex. Another example is the sun. And I guess the next slide is the sun, but you can see the sun in that picture. The sun is, so it's similar to the big bang. The sun is burning 600 million tons of hydrogen a second. So that's a scientific fact. It's like, well, that's impressive, <clears throat> but it's not just impressive. It's unbelievable. It's incomprehensible, probably a better word. Not only is it burning 600 million tons of hydrogen a second, that's not actually quite burning them, it's fusing them into helium, but it's been doing it for 4.5 billion years. I mean, these things are not really, they don't fit in a rational context and they should induce a sense of awe. So evolutionary ecological context, cottonwoods in that picture, there were no cottonwoods on the planet. Conifers, there were no conifers. Why the earth has water, especially liquid water. And then ecological context, I, <clears throat> I had to, I have to remind myself of these things, even though so this says ecological eyes, you probably can't see it, but it's something that was in the, in the naturalist. But I had to remind myself, what is an ecological context? Well, so where does the energy, energy from an ecosystem come from? Okay, we know the answer to that. <clears throat> it comes from the sun, but what are the variables? So can we think of variables? Well, there's day length. Deirdre mentioned day length. The days are getting longer. How about summer or winter? Cloud cover, aspect, latitude. How do the plants respond to these variables? So <clears throat> there is an ecological context. We just don't tend to think about it. I'm impressed by how much time we spent, we waste thinking about the trivia of our lives when we could be thinking about the ecological context. <laughs> We could just be thinking more ecologically because <clears throat> we live on an ecological planet and really it would address many 
of the human issues if we thought more about ecology. It's a picture of the sun, a little red arrow here on the upper right pointing to the earth. The sun is a million times larger than the earth. <clears throat> it's 93 million miles away. It's fusing hydrogen into helium. A small amount of the hydrogen is transformed into energy. Thank goodness for Albert Einstein, who made that possible with his formula E equals mc squared. The amount of energy and mass is uh, E equals m times the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second squared. Good Lord, where did that come from? Who knows? The point is there's a huge amount of energy in mass if you can transform it into energy. So forget the actual number, something like 4% is transformed into energy. The rest is transformed into helium. And, and, a, and one billionth of the sun's energy reaches the earth and that's what drives the biosphere. So it's an impressive arrangement. It's an unlikely arrangement. This is the first GIF. It's gonna start moving. I think it'll show up. Deirdre, tell me if this doesn't show up, but <clears throat> so this is, I'm gonna see if I can start that over again. Yeah, I can see it. It's great. Okay, so this is plate tectonics. This is, uh, this is the earth uh, crust. It's the earth mantle, which is either, we could call it plastic, we could call it molten, the earth's core, which is molten by the way, the earth's core at 9,000 degrees is the same temperature as the surface of the sun. The center of the sun is a lot hotter. Nonetheless, it's impressive. So this is a, a plate subducting. I'm gonna start that over again. I don't know that we wanna watch the whole thing. It's not very long. The point is that this is, is, this is one of the dyna dynamics of the planet and it's highly unlikely that the center of the earth would be completely molten. It's only the thin crust, something like 20 miles, 30 miles thick that is solid on the planet. Otherwise you'd burn your feet. <laughs> but without this molten core and plastic mantle, life would not be possible because this is recycling all the elements and molecules and nutrients that run to the ocean and go to the ocean crust are recycled by subduction. <clears throat> here's, a, here's a great little image of subduction. One plate subduct the older plate, which is colder and heavier, subducts under the other, under the other plate and is recycled into the Earth's mantle and then reappears in uh, mid-oceanic rifts and in, in magma vents. And in this case, they show a volcano. Hmm. Anyhow, it's, it's one of many dynamics and, and it drives plate tectonics. So this is an image of plate tectonics. Watch India over there on the right, float up to the Indian Ocean. In this image, it doesn't quite make it to Asia, which it crashed into before it starts over. The point is just these dynamics are occurring all the time. This, this <clears throat> moving image starts with the planet all put together in what we call Pangea. Uh, all the land masses were together in one place. Apparently this has happened numerous times over the history of the earth, over the 4.5 billion year history of the earth. So we're talking about dynamics. So I think I showed this slide before, but I'm, I'm bringing up the fact that the earth is tilted 23.5 degrees to the sun and by any physical law, it should be straight up. It should be 90, it, just the way it would have formed in uh, orbit around the around the sun as it accreted, it would have been 90 degrees, but it's not 90 degrees, it's 23. So that is because the planet was hit by a smaller planet they called a planetesimal. Very early in the history of the earth, it, it, was, a, it was a catastrophe in terms of the drama. It remelted the earth, sent more of the iron in the, in the earth matrix to the core, a uh, blue part of the crust into space, it was a catastrophe. Without that catastrophe, life on Earth would probably not be possible for a number of reasons. I think I addressed it before. It did thin the crust. If it hadn't thinned the crust, we probably would not have plate tectonics and the recycling of nutrients. Uh, but the tilt, which then created this effect, so this is going to move. This is uh, solar gain in the northern and southern hemisphere over the, over the seasons up top, somewhat blocked out on my computer, but I don't know if it is on yours. You can see the month circled with a little red circle. <clears throat> but you see, this shows the heat 
if the earth weren't tilted, the heat would accumulate at the equator and the cold would accumulate at the poles. It would probably be 200 degrees at the equator and permanently frozen at the poles. And the diversity of life would be vastly diminished. So that catastrophe, that Goldilocks is a Goldilocks effect. If that, if that planetesimal had not hit the earth, we would not have this variability and distribution of heat over the surface of the planet. So the next slide, I stopped this, I stopped that in the winter, <clears throat> just to show that it's gold where we are with the red arrow up there on the left. And in this particular time, which is just last month, I always have to think this through, the, the land cools faster than the ocean and it heats faster than the ocean. So in the winter, the land is colder than the ocean. The ocean's warmer in the winter. The ocean's warmer than the land. So the ocean is warm. The air is relatively warmer than on the land. So it's rising and it creates a low pressure area, brings the moisture up from the ocean because it's over the ocean. The rotation of the earth moves it to the east towards the land where it uh, gets over the, here, I tried to help myself here, uh, the high pressure on the land and the, uh, let's see, the land is colder, so the air is sinking where it's cold. And as the air sinks, it cools and it precipitates. So that's why it's snowing every week right now. It's because a planetesimal hit the earth 4.5 million years ago and creates this variation over time. This is, uh, this is windy.com. If you just type windy.com in your search box, you'll get this. I didn't remember how, I couldn't remember how to cut this video down. This just shows wind patterns. This is about two weeks ago, but if you look at it right now, so that uh, gyre on the left is a low, low, is a low pressure system. Low pressure systems turn counterclockwise in the Northern hemisphere. If you trace that out, you can see it's, it's, it's twisting counterclockwise. Interestingly enough, high pressure systems turn clockwise in the Northern hemisphere and it's the reverse in the Southern hemisphere. If you were to look at this right now, this low pressure system is right up against the coast. And there's another one behind it. They're worried about flooding in California. They have flooding in California. Anyhow, this is the air rising off the warmer ocean and moving over towards the, towards the continents. And it's just, uh, are we up to, how many dynamics are we up to? We have the, we have the, the Earth's mantle constantly churning and sending magma to the surface. We have the winds constantly moving over the surface of the earth. These are ocean currents. And these are not trivial players. The Gulf Stream, which is more or less shown there on the left, carries more water than all the rivers on the planet. And that is just one ocean current. And so this is all, it's all about the dynamics of the earth, how dynamic the planet is, and also the distribution of heat. You can't have all the heat. If you want to have optimum conditions for life, you can't have all the heat accumulating at the center, at the equator. It's got to be somehow distributed. So it's distributed by the tilt of the earth and it's distributed by uh, these ocean currents. Uh, this is the last GIF and it shows the last glacial advance. Uh, it, uh, and it's just another remarkable dynamic of the planet and very relevant to the Mad How. All of these dynamics strongly affect the Mad How. A lot of the rock in the Mad How Valley, surprisingly, is volcanic rock. There are no active volcanoes, obviously, now, but there were in the past, and that it comes from plate tectonics. Where the ice ages come from is uh, it's more of a question in my mind than it tends to be in the scientific community. They think they've got it explained with these Milankovitch cycles that the earth is different distance and tilt towards the sun at different times. I'm not sure that explains it. In any case, the point is, it's another dynamic that it, just 18,000 years ago, 18,000 years ago, the Methow was buried in a mile of ice. And there's very little sign of it at this time. There were also five species of elephants in North America and many other animals, and they're all gone. So I'm just emphasizing the dynamics of the planet We talked about this previously, and I think it looks initially a little daunting and then turns out to be very easy to understand the, at least the geometry, if not the why. 
And I bring this up because we are going through a short evolutionary history of really the met how, and we have to induce life to appear somehow. And how does life appear on the planet? Well, we can't answer that question, but what we can say is there is an intense intricate order to matter and life is composed of matter and the example the best example of that as far as i'm concerned is the hydrogen atom on the upper left there which has one proton and one electron and we know that much now there's an interesting little factoid in that protons are 2000 times larger than electrons but they have exactly the same electrical charge i don't know why i don't know the why of any of this so that electron is in what we call an electron shell often now called an orbital. Well, that shell, I talked about this previously, so I'm reiterating, but that shell holds two electrons. Now, I thought about that this morning. Why does it hold two electrons? I don't know why it holds two electrons, but it does, because there's only one proton in hydrogen. So you, you would think that would unbalance the atom. But in any case, it is a fact. More than that, there is an elect electric, I'll call it electric, proclivity, a tendency, a hunger to gain that second electron. So a hydrogen atom will readily join with other atoms to fill that electron shell. So in the lower left, two hydrogen atoms have joined together, become socialists, they're sharing their electrons, and now they both have full electron shells. Well, hydrogen can do that with many other elements. They could do it with water. Water has eight protons. A, and eight electrons. The first two electrons go in the first shell. Remember, it holds two. The other six electrons go in the second shell. The second shell holds eight. Well, where did this design come from? You know, obviously we don't know the answer to that, but it exists. Uh, so hydrogen, so two hydrogens could join with one oxygen. All three elements would have full electron shells, and they would then be electrically stable and not hunger for union with other molecules. You have water, H2O. Water is a naturally evolved uh, molecule, naturally evolved from the, inter the intrinsic design pattern of the universe and the elements. So hydrogen, you can fit 5 trillion hydrogen atoms on the head of a pin. They're not very big, and they all have this intricate design built in. Well, what's the point? The point is... The life may just be, I like this term that Christian Debood said, an obligatory manifestation of matter. Elements, because of, uh, because of these electron shells and the hunger to join with other atoms and create molecules, the universe has just naturally complexified over time. Uh, you can ignore the details, but make that statement. Has na and life is just another complexification of matter. There's always more to say about these things, like um, Bill Bryson says in uh, A Short History of Nearly Everything, the atoms that so readily join together to form life on Earth don't do it anywhere else in the universe. <laughs> That's also a good point, because the very same elements exist elsewhere in the universe. Anyhow, it does say there where conditions are appropriate. They own, the uh, conditions for life only seem to be appropriate on planet Earth. So you you came to the right place. In any case, life appeared. And there are some early life forms, single-celled organisms. Here's a complexification. It's a theme of evolution. It's a complexification. So we start out with bacterial cells. Bacterial cells are 100 times smaller than plant cells, 100 times smaller than animal cells, as much as 100 times smaller. They have no nucleus. They lack many of the organelles that exist, but they are living organisms and they appeared first. Now, why is this natural history of the, of the Mehal Valley? Uh, I'll, I'll come to this in the next slide or two, but this is all true for the Mehal. All of this is part of the story of the Mehal Valley. So it is said that plant cells and animal cells, you can see they're complex and they have numerous more organelles. It is said that a human cell, an animal cell, is as complex as a 747 jet, and yet it's invisible, invisibly small. So that's some serious complexification. This is the tree of life. 
none of this existed early in the history of the planet. There was no life. Life appeared. We don't know how, yeah, but it, it seems from, from the evidence uh, from evolutionary and chemical evidence that all life is related, that life appeared only once on the planet. And so I circle at the bottom, LUCA. The first organism's name was LUCA, and that stands for Last Universal Common Ancestor. And all other life has evolved and diversified from that first organism. And that's as true in the Medhow as it is anywhere. And I have tended to try and think of the Medhow as an evolutionary workshop and just instead of having to travel everywhere to see this variety, to learn about the evolutionary history of the Medhow Valley. So I just circled that word prokaryote. So bacteria and archaea, and I have two arrows there. So bacteria, we're used to that word. Archaea, we're less used to that word. In fact, bac bacteria and archaea, so they are simple cells. They don't have nuclei. They do have DNA but it's not in a nucleus. They don't have a nucleus, but <sighs> they were not split until, I forget the accurate date, but about 1970. They, they, were, they were split into two kingdoms because archaea as are, are now said to be as different from bacteria as humans are from plants or more different. So they felt obliged to split them into two and it just chemically, and I cannot explain the difference. I've read about it and I can't remember it. But they are united in a um, in the tree of life by being prokaryotes. They actually they actually put these in different domains. Bacteria is considered a domain of life. Archaea is considered domain of life, and everything else is a third domain of eukaryotes. And actually, eukaryotes is in that slide at the top of the picture, but it's blocked out by my screen. I don't know if it's blocked out by your screen. I think I just circled it, but I can't see it. So prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Well, these are important terms in biology. And we're talking about the natural history of the Meha Valley, which is partially biology. Prokaryote, the word means before, it means before the seed or before the cell. <clears throat> and our, our cells are a different kind. Our cells are called eukaryotes, which means the true cell. So it's typical human hubris to call our cells true cells and bacterial cells fake cells. But those that's what the words mean. And the reason they say that is because bacterial cells and archaea cells are so small and don't have nuclei. But a further point would be that all organisms on the planet have evolved from the initial the initiation of life on the planet, which we don't know how that happened. This is not a totally different picture. It just shows the, uh, the biomass of these different kingdoms so plants are a kingdom archaea up in the upper left that's a kingdom bacteria are a kingdom protists fungi animals viruses are not considered a kingdom we don't know what to do about viruses so that gt is billions of tons of carbon so what organisms dominate the planet obviously plants what plants dominate the planet trees trees are by bio biomass trees i mean i can look out the window and all i see are trees it's typical you know, in many places on the planet, and obviously they're rather bulky. Uh, 450 gigatons of carbon. Now, it's worth pointing out that they measure life in terms of the quantity of carbon incorporated into the biomass of that organism because carbon has a bad name. We want to pump carbon dioxide on, in, into holes in the ground because we think it's evil. <clears throat> where did plants, where did that 450 billion? Billion tons of biomass of carbon. It's carbon. There's more to the plant than carbon. That's only 35% of the weight of the plant, but they wait, they refer to it as carbon. Where did it come from? The mind bending fact of the matter is it came from carbon dioxide. The plant is made out of a gas in the atmosphere that only exists in 400 and probably 17 parts per million today, maybe 420 parts per million. It's, it's not comprehensible. It's like the sun burning 600 million tons of hydrogen a second for 4.5 billion years. These things cannot. All you can do is be in awe that this is the case. So why do plants dominate this graph chart of biomass on the planet? Because they are, heter they are autotrophs. They make their own food through photosynthesis. 
um, some protists down there low, but protists are so small, they don't weigh anything. Plants make their food, all the other organisms are dependent on it. <laughs> this kind of illustrates that fact. This is an energy pyramid. The energy available for life comes from the sun, but plants only capture 1% of the sunlight that reaches the earth, which is one billionth of the energy the sun puts out. So we're hanging by a shoestring here. Plants captured one percent. No. You better enjoy the day. Uh, what's that? What's that term? Carpe diem. Carpe diem. Seize the day. <laughs> and mute your mute your com your computer. Um, the J is for joules. It's a measure of energy. Like could be W watts. Could be some other measures of energy. A joule is a very tiny measure of energy. I looked it up once and it said one joule is the amount of energy a mosquito expends flying into a wall. <laughs> That's what it said. Uh, I don't know. It's not very much energy, but it's a measure of energy. And, you know, you can get a big number like at the bottom, one million joules of energy. Re of, so for every one million joules of energy that reaches the earth, 10,000 are captured. That's 1% captured by, by photosynthetic organism, plants and cyanobacteria, photosynthesizing bacteria. From then on, when organisms are consuming other organisms, only 10% of the energy is passed on. So if you look out the window, how many lions and tigers and bears do you see? None, because they're apex predators and there's no energy available at the top of the energy pyramid. It, it diminishes so much. Most of the energy available is in the hydrocarbon bonds in plants because they are the autotrophs. They are capturing the energy of the sun uh, via photosynthesis. So this is all. This is true for the methyl. All this, these these trees are capturing that energy that just came in eight minutes. Came from 93 million miles away. They're capturing that energy and, and incorporating into chemical bonds in in the hydrocarbon bonds, which is what they are in photosynthesis. Sure, of the of that plant, the leaves, the wood, and then that energy is available for the rest of life. So moving right along, the microcosm, it's not uninteresting. It is invisible, but not uninteresting. So the general numbers, these are approximations. I mean, it's almost a joke. Who could count? But, uh, but the human body has approximately 50 trillion human cells. It has an equal, approximately equal number of bacterial cells in constantly interacting. They're, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> But you are more virus particle, not by weight, but by numbers. You are far more virus. You're far more virus than you are human cells. So you're not going to get rid of your viruses. You better learn to live with them, I say. <laughs> but it's a creepy thought. And I've always liked this cartoon of all the organisms. A lot of those bacteria are on our skin and the viruses are on our skin. The bacteria are probably, probably feeding on the dead skin. In fact, all of our skin, I read that, all of our skin is dead. They're dead cells. So we walk around with... We walk around with these dead <laughs> exo, exo, not quite skeleton, uh, presenting it to the world, but it's sloughing off constantly. It has probably has hydrocarbon bonds in it. It's got energy in it. Bacteria are feeding on it. The viruses are feeding on the bacteria. They're bacteriophages. And that's all going on. If you're if you're if you have an itch, it may be because the viruses on your skin are eating the bacteria, which are eating the fluffing off skin. We are an ecosystem. And that is where we need to go psychologically. We need to understand that we're a part of something much bigger than our mind. Our mind tends to locate us in us, just a personality. So cyanobacteria, bacteria were the, were the first photosynthesizers. And I, I don't know why I don't have it right here. It must be in the next slide. But Famous scientist Lynn Margulis, she's famous because she was Carl Sagan's wife. Uh, <clears throat> where is that? Here's that the quote. So Lynn Margulis just points out it's the most important metabolic invention, innovation in the history of life. Photosynthesis creates 99.9% .9 of all the food on the planet because it captures the energy of the sun and it makes it available to all life forms. So let's see here. I don't know quite why I have that endosymbiotic 
process right there. Bacteria, cyanobacteria somehow invented photosynthesis. Chloroplasts, which are the organelles that do the photo, that capture the energy of the sun and incorporate it into hydrocarbon bonds uh, are the organelles that conduct photosynthesis. Well, photosynthetic plants have chloroplasts in them, but it's thought that they are bacterial cells that were captured and by plants and rather than being consumed, were incorporated into the body of the plant and they call it endosymb endosymbiosis. <laughs> life living together. So it's, it's at least another example of the complexification of life. There is the formula for photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water is turned into sugar and oxygen. Um, we take it for granted because we've heard it so often, but it's really kind of a magic trick. The water is, the hydrogen is split off the water combined with the carbon dioxide and somehow magically you get sugar. The energy is bound up in that carbon hydrogen bond by the positioning of the electrons, which we not only not, do not need to understand, but probably could not understand, but that's where the energy is held. And as those electrons move to different positions, they are able to release energy. It's quantum physics, sorry. But photosynthesis, the most important metabolic invention in the history of the world. So I might've mentioned this before, but if you Google photosynthesis at MIT, you get this little film of, of MIT graduates, the premier engineering, that's what they say in the, in the, in the video, the premier engineering school in the world. And they, add, they have this guy a seed. He's got a seed in that one hand, right hand. And then they hand him a piece of wood and they ask him, where does the wood come from? And it's a good question. Where does all this biomass, most of the biomass on the planet is trees. Where does it come from? He says dirt. He says the tree is sucking up dirt after, you know, is that after 16 years or 18 years of school? <laughs> he doesn't have a clue about the most important metabolic activity on the planet because it actually comes from carbon dioxide. The biosphere is appearing out of the atmosphere. You might as well have a magic wand. So Google it, watch it. It's very, it's short and it's very fun to watch. And that's, they did the program because they knew the college graduates have no idea about how photos photosynthesis works. The most important activity on the planet. So we talked about prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryote, a bacterial cell in the upper left there. It has DNA, but it, it, the DNA is just loose in the cytoplasm of the cell. I don't know what the advantages and disadvantages are. Obviously, it's not as well protected as, as if it's in a, in a nuclear membrane, in a nucleus. So in the eukaryote below, it is in a nucleus. And in, of course, all of our cells, all of our human cells, it, we have nuclei, most of our human cells. I'm not sure they all do. Uh, and uh, the DNA is protected. Where did the new, so, so I mentioned chloroplasts came from, it's, it's well established that chloroplasts in plants were, came from bacteria, bacteria that had somehow evolved the capacity for photosynthesis by creating chloroplasts. Those chloroplasts were ingested, which you can imagine this is in the lower right. That's what that's showing. It's ingesting a cell that could be chloro, a chloroplast type cell. It's incorporating it into the body of the cell. The same thing is true of mitochondria, mitochondria, which are also organelles in our body. They're the ones that break down the hydrocarbon bonds and turn it into an, a form of energy that the cell can, that the cell in the body can use. Mitochondria, mitochondria have their own DNA. Chloroplasts have their own DNA, and that's how they know that these are these are endosymbiotic. That they were they were once free living bacteria because they, when you're when, when you reproduce, have offspring, all of the DNA in the mitochondria come just from the mitochondria and, the, and that DNA comes just from your mother. I don't know why, but I, I, it, it humors me that we have more of our mother in our bodies than we have of our fathers because all the mitochondria DNA came from our mothers. 
In any case, that's how we know these are endosymbiotic. And it was Lynn Margulis, who, who, who I mentioned, made that statement about photosynthesis and was Carl Sagan's wife, is the one who figured this out. And at first people would not believe it, but she came up with the genetic proof that this is the case. So we end up with protus, which have uh, these organelles inside. They all have mitochondria. They don't all have, all plants have chloroplasts, but not all animal, animal cells don't have chloroplasts, but they have organelles of various kinds. Anyhow, these are your relatives because they have the same kind of cell you have, eukaryotic cells. So one other interesting point, I thought, what about the nucleus? So, you know, I just, I just said something about the origin of mitochondria mitochondria in our cells and the origin of the dog? <laughs> oh dog are you lucky dog if you look oh up if you look the so just a minute Dana, oh. let's, somebody's not muted here okay it's philip i just muted him sorry about that okay. hopefully he wasn't being critical i just went and got a little clock here um uh, and if, I realized they hadn't said anything about the origin of the nucleus. So remember, prokaryotes don't have nuclei and eukaryotes do have nuclei. Where did it come from? If you Google it, the most likely theory for the origin of the nucleus is from viruses. There are viruses that are super large. They call them giant viruses. They're almost as large as cells. The viruses invade eukaryotic cells, that's what viruses do, and, and actually prokaryotic cells, which would be bacteria. They invade them both and they inject their DNA into those cells. That's what viruses do and take over the, the chemical manufacturing capacity of those cells and they produce more viruses. That's all I can say about it, but it's an interesting point because we are virus adverse that the origin of the nuclei in our cells may be from viruses and you can look it up yourself. So it's possible I should have taken this slide out because we don't have too many coccolithophores. These are protists. These are single celled organisms. Uh, they, they can be heterotrophs, which means photosynthetic or auto, uh, autotrophs, photosynthetic means self-feeding, autotroph, self-feeding, heterotroph, other feeding, eat other things. Many of these, cell, many of these um, cells can be either autotrophs or heterotrophs, take back. We don't have so many of these in the Meta Valley, but these form these shells. The coccolithophores form shells of calcium carbonate, dinoflagellates, calcium carbonate, radiolarians, out of silica. These came up because I do want to talk about diatoms, and diatoms are very common in the Meta Valley, and diatoms are major, major players in the biosphere. We'll talk about that in the next slide, but I got led to these things. So these are more commonly marine. We probably have, I think there's, I think there's dinoflagellates and late radiolarians in freshwater as well. The most interesting thing about this, or one very interesting thing, is that dinoflagellates are the organisms that are symbiotic with coral and do and, and what feed the coral because they're photosynthetic. So they're able to capture the energy of the sun. You probably can't have corals that are a mile deep because there's no sunlight. All the corals are near the surface because they have these photosynthetic organisms, dinoflagellates, in their, in their physical structure, calcium carbonate structure, I presume, of coral, and uh, producing the food that feeds the coral. Well, coral bleaching, the dino, we've all heard of coral bleaching, the dinoflagellates flee the cells because the theory is it's too warm for them and they can't live in the warmer water. I just found it interesting to figure out that that's what those organisms are that live in corals and make coral life possible. So not so many of these in the Methow, but interesting organisms and big players, radiolarians, it says that there, I have this fact written down, 20% of the ocean floor is made up of the shells of radiolarians. And I can't, you know, I've never measured it myself. I don't know how true these are. The point is, is these microscopic organisms become, become major players in the ecology of the planet. So all the silica has settled to the um, ocean floor and would stay there, but for plate tectonics, the ocean plates are recycled. They go down in the mantle and come back in the mid-oceanic rift zones. Those are the white cliffs of Dover up there in the center I just pulled up. They're made out of coccolithophores, calcium carbonate. That's on the you know, coast of England. But more to the point, for the Methow, these are diatoms. 
Diatoms create shell. The diatoms are single celled organisms. They're protists. They're actually considered a form of algae. They make their shells out of glass. There are thousands of species of diatoms, and they make these intricate, beautiful structures out of glass, which is quartz, silica dioxide, SiO2. I'm sure if you were to figure out SiO2, the electron shells would be full. And that you know they'd be happy being quart. They'd be happy being quartz. <clears throat> Uh, they're photosynthetic. Diatoms are photosynthetic. So not only are they photosynthetic, uh, well, I'm trying to remember where I want to go with this. For one thing, diatoms are very common in the Mahar River. And let's see, uh, Tim Hall. Some of you might know the name Tim Hall. I haven't seen Tim for a long time, but he was here at my place. And he said, this was like 15 years ago. He said, you know, the algae on the rocks is full of diatoms. I was so surprised that that was the case. So about 10 years ago, I started looking at the slime, the stuff we slip on when we try and walk, walk across a shallow place in the river that is sometimes called rock snot. Spread it, spread it out on a slide and it's full of diatoms. And you can see them at about, I forget, probably about 40 magnification. You're able to see them in 100 magnification. They're bigger. Full of diatoms. Well, diatoms are a big player on the planet. How is that possible? Well, for one thing, diatoms, diatoms are just massively abundant in the world's oceans. I think this shows, so that's Alaska. You can sort of make out the outline of Alaska there and the Aleutian Islands extending down to the left, that turquoise green color is, an, is a diatom bloom in the Bering Sea. So that is uncountable zillions of diatoms that the conditions are right for a diatom bloom. And they're, so they're photosynthetic, which means they are capturing the energy of the sun and incorporating into hydrocarbon bonds and building the base of the food chain that allows uh, heterotrophs, other eaters to exist. So diatoms have increased on the planet massively. There were no diatoms until they seem to have been invented <clears throat> roughly 100 million years ago, 120 million years ago. They were not abundant until 30 million years ago in the oceans. When they became abundant, they became another uh, abundant food source for life in the ocean. Why did they become abundant? They, be they make their shells out of silica, quartz. They became abundant at the same time that the grass family spread across the face of the land masses of the planet, all of the Midwestern, North America, Central or Southern South America, especially the, the savannas of Africa. There was no grass family 50 million years ago. It's a 30 million year old family, but it became abundant 20 million years ago. Grass takes up silica as, as a defense against herbivores into the structure of the leaf. And it turns it into an organic form from a mineral form and even a, 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 a soluble form, silicic acid. When, they, when the grass dies and decomposes, the silicic acid goes into the, the waterways of the land and flows into the ocean. So all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, it took time, but 30 million years ago, 20 million years ago, silica was flowing off the land into the oceans because of the... Um, multiplication, the spread of the grass family, which is now one of the most dominant families on the land, the grass family. That's when diatoms increased, and they particularly increased in northern latitudes. They like cold water, northern and southern latitudes, also near Antarctica. Well, that is about the time that baleen whales appeared. Baleen whales are filter feeders. I don't know that their filter is fine enough to filter out diatoms, but, but the, it's the micro, the micro animals that feed on diatoms because diatoms are autotrophs. So diatoms are creating their own food. Then a whole ecosystem is going to evolve around the diatoms of protists and the baleen whales. This food source became available and whale and baleen whales appeared i forget when but in an appropriate time frame maybe 10 million years ago when diatoms and this is all interconnected this is related to the evolution of grass the evolution of diatoms silica flowing into the ocean so these are diatoms in the methal 
this is a sheet. I can't see the top of that page. You probably can. I have some kind of little menu thing up there. But diatoms in the Methow and any of these sheets that exist from the Methow Naturalist, all these have been in the Methow Naturalist. You know, I'm happy to email them to you if you happen to want any of them. But I pull a sheet out every, you know, every winter, like now, I start pulling that. Uh, I bring, a, I actually bring a cobble. I have a, a little cobble sitting in a little bowl on the table downstairs. And I'll pull off a little, just a little bit of scudge off of that and spread it out on a slide and put a slide cover on it, look at it in a, in a in a microscope, it's full of diatoms. That scudge is mostly diatoms and diatoms are a form of algae and they don't just create glass algae; they create this mucilage. They need a way to hang on to the rock. So there is more to a diatom than the glass house, but the glass house is a photosynthesizer. This is a very common diatom everywhere in the Methow. It's, it's, it's called by the fishermen. The fishermen call it didymo because this genus is didymosphena. It's a, it's a beautiful, it looks, I call it the Coke bottle the Coke bottle diatom, uh, because it looks like a Coke bottle. I think the central picture is probably a biologist artist at work who has somehow arranged those to look pretty. So, uh, you know, they don't join together like that in, in natural life. They're just, they're just multitudes of them floating around on the end of mucilaginous threads. But they are, they create these masses of, of uh, algae in the early summer, and then they die in the late summer. These are actually, there's a, it's unknown whether this didymo is native or non-native, but it is considered to be a weed, surprisingly, because it creates these masses of uh, diatomaceous material that then dies. And as it decomposes, it starts taking oxygen, rather than producing oxygen, it takes oxygen out of the water. So the fishers biologists are worried about the spread of this particular diatom. So I go back to this because we're going to move on to fungi, and I thought I would show the bio, the the, the uh, assumed biomass of fungi on the planet. You know, they can't hold a candle to either bacteria or plants, but 12 gigatons, that's 12 billion tons. You know, nobody has weighed the fungi on the planet. We don't know for sure. These are estimates, but they have a role to play. And what is that role? Well, I like to ask are, you know, all of these organisms that we've talked about, are they sentient? Do, do they, we use that word, we like to apply that word to our species, homo, homo sapiens are sentient. What does sentient mean? I think it means they perceive the world. The humans have a particular way of perceiving the world. Well, I've been mildly shocked to realize, and you know, what is uh, Young, Ed Young, is his name Ed Young, Y-O-N-G? He has YouTubes and books, An Immense World. He has a book out called An Immense World. It's about how every animal, every living organism is sentient in its own way. And it's obvious this mushroom has a certain sentience. Okay, now I'm joking because I nailed those two puffballs up there because I was struck by how that oyster mushroom that is decomposing that cottonwood tree, the cottonwood tree was dead. This is on my property and it's 10 years ago. But it's not there anymore because I ate it. Uh, but that tree fell over, and as in, in fact, um, you can't just have living things tying up all of the nutrients of the planet in their organic structure, falling over dead because living things only live so long, partly because life is the planet, the universe is dangerous, and no, only all organisms only live so long and then they fall over dead. If they were not taken back apart, life would have petered out on the planet three billion years ago. Life is about 3.8 billion years, years old on the planet. All but it's our good fortune that we have what we call decomposers. I, I think I, in the next slide, I call them recomposers here, here. No, it's not, it's coming up. So fungi, are evolved organisms as everything is. Remember, everything evolved from Luca, the last universal common ancestor. What are they closely related to? Fun this is a cladogram which shows evolutionary relationships. Fungi are next to animals. Fungi, your closest, your closest relatives on the planet other than animals are mushrooms. <laughs> no offense. But they had to, something had to arise. And of course, bacterial, bacteria are also decomposers. But Bacteria are not very good at breaking down lignin 
actually. It's fungi, you know, lignin evolved over time. There, there were not always trees. There was not always wood. There was not always lignin. It appeared about three, 300 million years ago. It's a, it's a tough physical structure and very difficult to break down. And primarily it's mushrooms that can, fungi that can do it. The mycelial threads of fungi. Everything has to cycle. All, if the, nothing, none of these, life is, these are nutrients and molecules, in the case of water, necessary for life. They're limited. It's a finite planet. They're limited. If they didn't cycle, life would have come to an end long ago. But they do cycle uh, because of the decomposers and recomposers. So here is a recomposer. It's on this tree stump. I forget what species that is, but uh, it's breaking down that tree stump and making the nutrients available to life again. So the recomposers are utterly necessary. From there, I'm going into a few stories about fungi, about mushrooms. And this, this is a mushroom that some of you would have seen. Unfortunately, I forget what fall it was. It was either three years ago or four years ago. This mushroom appeared at the base of the cottonwoods everywhere in the Mehau Valley. I remember, I remember talking to Annika, who lives on the Twist River and has a little riverfront, and she said they were all over under the cottonwoods down by the river on the Twist River. I saw them at the suspension bridge. There were hundreds of them, hundreds of them in that spot near the suspension bridge under the cottonwoods. I asked somebody who was going to the Puget Sound Mycological Society meeting in Seattle to ask them about this bolete. So these are, yeah, this is Boletus reginius, the queen bolete. Boletes don't have gills, they have pores. You can sort of see that the underside is tiny holes, not pores. They're tiny, tiny holes, not gills. Ask them at the Mycological Society, what species of bolete grows under cottonwoods? And the experts said, boletes don't grow under cottonwoods. And so they were wrong. And that's my point at the moment. That's the story is that Experts only know what they know about, and they don't know what they don't know about. I have only seen that mushroom bloom one time in the many years I've been in the Mahab Valley. Three years ago, there were tens of thousands of them, and they're big and they're edible. I never saw them before, and I haven't seen them since. So it's, it's an interesting, it's just a mushroom story. This is another bolete. It's a king bolete. It's, it's considered in a, in some, by some the most delicious mushroom on the planet. And it is not uncommon in the montane forest in the Meta Valley. Actually, it's a little better if you go to Rainy Pass, at which point you're no longer in the Meta Valley. But I've been thinking we should probably adopt Rainy Pass because it adds a lot to the Meta Anyhow, they need a little more moisture than we tend to get in the Meta. They grow under, con under, the, under conifers in late summer if we get rain, which we do sometimes and not other times. The whole mushroom is edible and delicious. And there is, oh yeah, this is another edible mushroom, the lion's mane. So this is on the uh, uh, Easy Pass Trail. And what interested me about this, this is edible and I took a picture and then I cut it off. I took it home and I ate it. And I went up the trail the next year and it was back because the, the mycelium the actual body of the mushroom is decomposing that log is inside that log. So this is just the fruiting body and it reappeared the next year and I cut it off and ate it. And another one time, I think on that same trail, it was an easy pass, easy pass trail. There was a huge lion's mane up in a dead tree hanging off the trunk of a dead tree, but it was 12 feet up and I couldn't reach it. So I got a stick and I swung at this huge mushroom and I had to catch it before it hit the ground or it would split into a hundred parts. So I hit it with a stick, dropped the stick and I caught the mushroom and was able to bring it home and eat it and cut it up and put it into little little uh, paper things and sell it at farmer's market, which was illegal, but I did it anyhow. Uh, so there is a list from the Mahou Naturalist of the edible mushrooms. If you want it, I'll send it to you. But we have lots of edible mushrooms. The ones we've talked about are on here, but there are many more. The problem that we have in the Mahou is it doesn't rain very often in late summer. When it does, we have abundant mushrooms. But more often, it doesn't rain. We don't just don't get the moisture. So I guess, yeah, we're closing in on the end, and it's appropriate, 958. I don't know why. 
ecology doesn't sink in more than it does. It's really, it's as good as religion to say the least. Uh, life cycles, life is, you know, the, 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 uh, the mythology of Christianity is resurrection, the resurrection of life. It's just like they, the Christians took uh, the solstice and turned it into Christ, Christmas and they turned <laughs> the renewal of life through ecological processes into the resurrection. It's okay, but, but it's not ecology. The ecological story is rich and meaningful. So, you know, death is a problem for us because we're alive and death is never popular. And I, Melanie pointed out to me the other day that um, there's no organism that is eager to die until those last moments maybe but in general it's natural to not embrace death but death is so natural and it's it's not a hundred percent death uh there are good poems you know by walt whitman and others that that uh there would be no life if it weren't for death it's a flow and i, I think our lives would be richer if we could get a feel for that and realize it's not it's not a story it's not a a belief it's real that life and death are interconnected and we are blessed with being able to participate in this journey i felt obliged to put lichens in because they're mostly fungi this is the end of the slideshow but there are a few fungi here so these crustose lichens over on the left are super common on the rocks in the Metha valley and if you can imagine living on a rock in the Metha valley <clears throat> they're only wet for three weeks three weeks of the year and that's when they photosynthesize. Do fungi photosynthesize? No, they're in a symbiotic relationship with algae. There are algae living inside the fungal body. They photosynthesize, make sugar out of sunlight and carbon dioxide, feed the fungus. The fungus removes nutrients from the rocks by creating acids that dissolve the rock. Very slow process. And then these cladonia, it's very pretty. They call them British soldiers because of the red caps, but they're common up. Uh, in the in the coniferous forest oh yeah a little more story here i forgot got to get to the end of this so this is amanita muscaria you recognize it because it's the most famous mushroom on the planet it's reputed to be poisonous it can be somewhat poisonous it's also psycho psychotrophic it is mind turning the picture on the left was at the twist city park i took that picture at the twist city park and the one on the right was on the Foggy Dew Trail. And that's a penny in that picture. It shows you how big that mushroom is. Well, there are some curious connections. This mushroom, it's reputed to be poisonous. If you ate it raw, you would throw up. If you process it, it alters your perception of the world in ways that many people where this mushroom grows thought was worthwhile. It, it may bring to the foreground the magical, the miraculous quality of the universe that I have alluded to by mocking the way that science deals with the Big Bang and the origin of life. And I didn't mention gravity. We don't really understand. I mean, a lot of the basics of the planet we don't understand, but we, we pretend to explain them. There is magic afoot. And, and so, I actually, I actually have this mushroom on the right. So the way to detoxify it is to dry it in the oven and then powder it and then take the powder. Well, I have had the powder of that mushroom downstairs for a year and a half and I've been afraid to take it. So just tell you how these things unfold there. The problem is there really is more to life than meets the eye. So it wasn't my idea. Michael Pollan wrote the book, How to Change Your Mind. You've heard of it. It's a good book. I think that's yeah, a good book. I'd like to read it again because the real, the point is not that you should be taking mind altering drugs. The point is that there is more to life than meets the eye. And how are we gonna access it? Because we live in a miraculously unfolding biosphere. It's not a recommendation. It's just that more, we need to continue to expand our awareness. That is the point. So there's a little side story here. Do you see any resemblance between these two eukaryotes? That is Amnita muscaria on the left and Santa Claus on the right. Well, remember, Santa Claus 
flies through the air in a sleigh drawn by reindeer. He flies through the sky and delivers gifts to all the people of the earth. That's nice of him. Uh, the, so this mushroom is very common in Siberia and the Sami people, tribal people, the way that they detoxify it is they feed it to reindeer and then they capture the reindeer's urine and they drink the urine and it's got the mind the, the mind altering drug in the urine and they drink it. That's a true story. And so there's a connection between Santa Claus who is dressed like an Amanita muscaria and reindeer which detoxify the Amanita do these two look similar? This is a Sami shaman person, shaman and an Amanita. What's down here? Oh, yeah. Why are these girls seeing elves on this Amanita muscaria? <laughs> what so, funny. so Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, why does Rudolph, what is that about? What is it? So I put a little Amanita muscaria on Rudolph's nose. This is actually a meaningful story to me. I don't know if you, find, if you feel there's a connection there. I'm quite sure this story... Uh, the story of this reindeer flying through the sky, people who take Amanum Nascari feel like they're flying. Uh, it, it's, it, it's the whole story of Santa Claus arose because of Amanum Nascari. And the, the humor in this is that the whole world, you know, uh, celebrates Santa Claus, or most of the world, much of the world, not the whole world, much of the world, and um, gift giving to little children. And it's a drug story. <laughs> it's a story that evolved from this Amanum Nascari. This is a point. There's more to life than meets the eye. You don't have to take a mushroom to be able to see it, but we need to, I would say we need to quiet down our constantly chattering mind and look around. That's what I would say. Paul Ehrlich says, studies have shown people perceive about one trillionth of the world. I don't know how true that is, but I'm sure we don't see most of what there is around us. Last slide, Thich Nhat Hanh. <clears throat> I think most of you know who Thich Nhat Hanh was. He died, I think, last year. He was a Buddhist monk. He taught meditation. He has many good statements about life on earth. And this is, you know, this first line is a good line. People consider walking on water to be a miracle. But I think the real miracle is not to walk on water, but to walk on the earth. If you think of the complexity even as we've talked about it in this program, our 50 trillion cells all functioning, all building themselves from, we started out as a single cell. How is it possible? It's a miracle. Every day we're engaged in a miracle. We don't recognize blue sky, white clouds, green eyes, the curious eyes of a children, our own eyes. All is miracle. That's the end. Got a little heavy there. Sorry. 